us, but I don't know. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I didn't see that. We'll move the click here, like that. Okay, thank you very much. Do you have some things on that? Can I ask a question? My question. Yeah. To you. Of course. Okay. So I did ask uh, Angela to talk to you because I thought I could just ask her to you. That's great. Isn't it? So when is she? I was born in this little ancient village behind a small little house behind a small little church. I grew up with my, with my parents. My parents are, were farmers, um, just to cause bad food for actually feed just a family. My mom would try to work two jobs, but she was a teacher in the daytime and at night, you know, she would just set up like a little shop in front of the house. I think that's what most people would do uh, in the city. Mm -hmm. It was a small two bedroom with a kitchen, no running water, no electricity, but it was beautiful. Two hours, on food. Well, we always like to play soccer, so we would break a lot of things in the house. Uh, I would play outside the house. It's this game is like marbles, jumping rope.
I remember was we were all running. There was uh, coast guards and police officers that were shooting, um, and uh, everyone just took off. took us into this train. We were so afraid that you wouldn't be able to leave the stop. People who are being persecuted, people leave their, their homes going to a foreign country where they know, uh, no one advises you, um, this is how you go, or you have to go here, it's, it's difficult. Well, my mom uh, at the time felt like you know the, the only way for us to really to give us a future was to leave the country. soldier with a rifle and it's been so long I was only not even five years old and I still remember this man Anything could happen. It could capsize, storm, uh, pirate. 95% of the people got seasick. When I was 12, she put me on the boat. She felt like if she could only handle one of them to go at a time. You know, she can't lose um, all the kids. other people there, other families. I remember them visiting him into his camps. I was a little girl, so obviously, you know, my visual was a lot of cardboards and sheets and people living so close to each other.
I was an unaccompanied minor, pretty much by myself, not knowing what's going on, not knowing where you're going to go, you know, what's going to happen, how am I going to get food, um, what are we going to eat, and how am I going to eat, and who am I going to talk to so I can get some food. Things are better, but they're not easier. So typically we would get up, eat some breakfast, go to school, come back, um, <clears throat> have dinner, lots of free time. On the very first day I applied for, for asylum, I, 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 I was shocked that the woman who conducted my interview from the very onset, she told me she didn't believe me. Why can't my family be with me? Why am I here? What did I do to deserve something like this? I was being sent to a transit camp where I spent um, three months. But it was just a, a sleeping place. It was not like a place where you could really feel um, free or uh, privacy. Time was, I guess it didn't really matter, you know. One day over Friday, Monday, Saturday, it didn't really matter. It's, it's all the same. I was in refugee camp for nine months. I just remember it was raining. It was really, really cold. And I think the thought just really hit me. I'm here on my own and, and it's, uh, I'm not going back home and I may not get to see anybody um, again. And again, it was raining all the way. And we arrived in the evening, I remember, raining, and my uncle um, waiting for us. Uh, the most important thing for me was my brother was there waiting for me. And when I fell into his arms, I know everything was fine. You know, excitement from the standpoint that I I'm being united with somebody I know, but scared is, is not knowing what the future holds for me. You know, I knew it was different, and I, I, I felt different, but I you know, the way I was treated, you know, people were very helpful, even though the first couple of years I couldn't really communicate. We had wonderful neighbors that helped us a lot. You know, they just took us in. Unless you're a refugee, I don't think anyone could fully understand what that's like. Um, 
to leave everything that you know, everything that you love behind to go somewhere was totally different. You know, just to have a, a hope of something better. Thank you very much for your attention on that. Um, we're going to learn more about the genesis of that project and um, where it's been shown and how it relates to design um, in a little bit. Um, but first, let me introduce our panel. Um, we're discussing in the afternoon now design for advocacy and social communication in crises, where our panelists will discuss how design drives storytelling for humanitarian advocacy. Uh, the panel is moderated by Babita Bish, who's an expert on strategic engagement and advocacy. Um, sh there, she's joined by, on the far left, uh, Giorgio Baravalle, who is the creative director at Demo Design. Uh, next to him is Leslie Thomas, the founder of Lark Incorporated and Artworks Projects for Human Rights. Um, to her, to Bibita's right, is Sean O'Hay. He's the deputy director of the Humanitarian Unit at Irish Aid. And um, the final panelist is Thatcher Bean, the film director for for Mass Design Group. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Babita. Thank you. Thank you so much to Angela and Alberto and uh, the organizers for bringing us all together. Um, I think uh, this is a fascinating topic and a fascinating panel also to discuss these issues with. Uh, the film gave us a good intro in terms of the theme of the panel, and Leslie will talk to it uh, uh, shortly. But before I begin, I'd like to give a short overview of the session. Um, I'll start with some highlights on the humanitarian landscape, and then the panelists will then share the experiences and the insights through two rounds of questions. And then we'll open it to the audience for your questions to the panelists, and on that basis, um, summarize and close. I think uh, it goes without saying, I think that this topic really dares provocation. It requires out-of-the-box thinking, and so really, please go for it when you have your questions. Um, the heart of the question really is, uh, the, the challenge that we're all grappling with in different ways, is how can we help people most in need? People affected by conflict, people affected by natural disasters. Uh, the numbers are staggering. Uh, we have 134 million people in need of humanitarian aid. That was the recent estimate that was released earlier in the week. We've heard about, of course, the record high numbers of people displaced, uh, more than 68 million. And again, these stats are really important and they're staggering, but so are the stories behind them. And so humanitarian advocacy is really important to tell the story, to tell the story of the people that are affected, to tell the story with them, for them, by them, to really generate the empathy, the compassion, and most importantly, to inspire action. Action at a global scale, because these challenges are global, and also action at local levels, and I think more and more you will hear this term being used, local. So having said that, I think there are really three key points to consider while we keep people at the center of all our efforts. Uh, one is who decides? Who decides the fate of this 134 million people? And I think here is that whole spectrum, the Security Council, governments, the media, the public, and people like you and I. And so I think working together, I think that's a really 
wide spectrum of really uh, influences and decision makers that are important. The second, I think, um, point is how can we reach, advocate, and engage with people across institutions, at individual levels, because we're really trying to cut through the clutter, you know, um, trying to really compete for hearts and minds, and how do we stand out? And the third point in all of this is, um, what would success look like? Because I think the numbers are big, the issues are just so complex, it's messy, sometimes there's no real end in sight, and um, it can be very overwhelming for all of us. And I think it's really important to be part still of that global solidarity, of global efforts that really um, saves lives, that protects people, that reduces suffering, but most importantly now, to really prevent those things from happening again and again that we see in South Sudan, we see in Syria. And uh, I think that is the kind of thinking that we need for transformation and change. So having said that, I would like to now um, look to our panelists to really share the experiences of how they've used um, good design for a humanitarian cause, what were the challenges, and uh, what worked. So let's start with Leslie, because I think the film is really fresh in our minds, and then we'll go to Giorgio, and then to Thatcher, and then Sean, because he represents a top government, we'll have an adapted question for him. So we'd love to hear your story, Leslie. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, can I tilt this a little bit? Um, I thought that what might be the most useful is to use this particular project, Sanctuary and Sustenance, as a bit of a case study as to how we approach this question of crafting uh, stories or interpreting stories or sharing stories around humanitarian crises for the global audience that we serve. Um, there's a slide up right now. Um, this a little bit taller, sorry. Um, there's a slide up right now which shows you a few samples of how this project is normally seen. So if you think about the 15 minute or so film that you just saw, it's always an interaction in a public space. It's projected on a building or a series of buildings and done outside along with public programming. It's multi-partnered. Usually audiences have heard from local stakeholders, NGOs, impacted communities, uh, welcoming communities, so on and so forth. It's a little bit academic to see it you know, in a building on a screen, but it gives you a sense. All of our work is done for one purpose, which is to build empathy. Every project that I've worked on in the last dozen years, from our first one, Darfur, Darfur, around genocide in Sudan and Chad, through to a current uh, project that Georgia and I are collaborating on about ending female genital mutilation is designed with only one thing in mind, and that is that the recipient, the viewer, the person engaging in the story, in whatever form it comes to them, feels some connection, feels some emotional connection, and then, if we've done our job, makes some action. So we have two points of failure. If you're a half-empty person, I'm not, but just to, to go to the, you know, what, what failure looks like so you can avoid it. Um, if you haven't connected here, and if you haven't made it very straightforward for your audience, and I'll get to who your audience is in a minute, to do something. So we work really, really hard to try to understand and craft a project that can be multi-formed. All of our work is kind of grounded in documentary photography, in music, in filmmaking, in multimedia sort of tools, and then it becomes a projection, it becomes a print exhibition, it becomes a book, it becomes a feature-length documentary, lots of different things using that same story that you've crafted. And when you get back to empathy, the reason that we focus so hard on that is that there are seven billion people in the world, and it's really difficult to find one who will tell you with a straight face that genocide is a good thing, or extreme gender violence, or separation of children from their families, to use something more current. Um, pretty much all seven billion of us are clear about these things. The challenge is the day is very busy, the world is noisy, so how do you get through? Additionally, because the world is somewhat large, we don't always immediately identify with the human beings that we could feel for. We don't always see 
exactly how to make that communication. When we did this story, we wanted to say, globally, there are millions of people who are displaced for lots of different reasons. They're economic migrants, they're refugees, they're forced, you know, they're in forced labor, they're global uh, climate change migrants. I mean, there's lots and lots of reasons people do not have a home or shelter or sanctuary. But what are the common threads, which is how we broke this into home, displacement, uh, asylum, landing, and so forth, and how can we tell a story that will be collective? So we started with this very general idea, but then working with my co-director, Maren Wickwire, we said this has to be extremely specific to your point about global, right? So in this case, we took three narratives, a woman from, who was displaced after World War II from an island that's now Croatian, was Yugoslavian, and when she was born was Italian, and made her way to the United States, a man who was displaced from Cameroon, and another man who was displaced from Vietnam. We we wove their individual stories, which were quite specific. We interviewed them, we kind of pulled that together, along with this clear collage of, of images. And the hope was that as audiences, as you see from this slide, it's been shown all over the world and continues to be, that if you are in this audience in Germany, in a small town that is in the midst of a huge debate about resettlement from Syria, that you may see someone in that audience that looks like your mother, brother, sister, or yourself, and just for a moment, you're not quite sure you should keep protesting the family that just needs a home. That's a specific story from a, a town in Germany that was going through quite a bit of challenge around resettlement. The local cathedral asked us if they could put together an exhibition, and then they built a program around this. So those are the kinds of methodologies um, of storytelling, of narrative, of weaving that, that eternal, that specific, that general, um, that we try to use in doing these projects. And then really just saying, OK, who is the audience at the time that you're going to show it? Our work is always designed to reach three audiences, the general public, the seven billion people again, but we try to focus on the ones that don't sit in this room, who do not identify as human rights advocates, who are not humanitarian workers. You're our partners. You're the ones that we want to make the, partner, the projects for, uh, through the media that covers what the general public looks at, and then high-level policymakers. So work can be shown you know, uh, at a museum, at a school, at a cultural center. Equally so, half of our work gets shown uh, to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, at the European Parliament, at the United Nations, and sometimes it's an audience of six. But if it's six people who are bipartisan members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee looking at allocation of funding for displaced children out of Syria, it's not a bad audience. So that's kind of the toolkit in a really short period of time <laughs> that we do. That really covers quite a lot, rich range of issues, and I hope we can also speak to it in different ways uh, uh, through other panelists too. So over to Georgie. Okay, so mine is, I brought actually a, a specific example <clears throat> of how design can touch uh, people differently and, and how to open a dialogue between the subject matter, <coughs> excuse me, and the audience. So uh, this is a project we did on, um, well, first of all, let's, let's, let's say one thing. There, there's two principles in design that I think that are very important when we design for humanitarian purposes, and, and not only for that. One is that um, the, there is a basic concept, idea behind what we do, and <clears throat> whatever project we work on is to be the visual communication of this idea. And whatever the form of the final project is, it's dictated by, this, by the idea that is behind the, <clears throat> the project. And second of all, the project needs to be engaging to the audience, whoever looks at it, and it has to be some kind of engaged in a meaning, meaningful way. And uh, those are the two principles we use when we design exhibitions or films or whatever that we, the project we have to work on. Um, this, this was a project that we collaborated with Leslie, and there was an exhibition that uh, was for, to raise awareness for women in Afghanistan. And we didn't want their, their voice to be lost in the, in the international uh, 
politics and war that was happening at the time in Afghanistan. So, um, uh, let's see. <laughs> so uh, that's basically, and, and I think that after that I want to go in a little bit more details in, in what it means to build something that has form and content connected. So when we first, uh, yeah. Yeah. Which one is the button? Yeah. So when we first uh, um, start designing, we use the weave of the burqas of the Afghanist women as a base to design the main logo of the book. I also have it here, but you'll see slides off. Um, then the, the second step was to build, we did all of this really by hand, and we um, put together, a st we actually have a big stamp and ink, and we single angle stamped every single cover of the book. And then we folded the 20 poster were inside, it was part of the exhibition, the booklet for the exhibition. And then we put, we sent it between two boards and then use the string that, late, that later will be used to hang the exhibition to, the whole, to hold the whole thing together. So we came out with a package that is very tactile, it's very interesting, not just uh, a cold object that comes to you in the mail, but it's something that has a meaning and has, um, you know, a connotation that really relates to the, to the concept. Um, so this, the, also this, uh, the fact that the materials we use is something that uh, in our company we pay a lot of attention of for. And, and for example, in, in, uh, we designed a book to raise awareness about Chernobyl and the radiation in Chernobyl. And we wrapped the whole book in plastic with the, so that after a while you hold the book, the book is very uncomfortable in your hands. You start sweating. So this is something that I think is very important to help communicate to the audience, you know, what, what is it that, how can we help and how we can get across a message in the most possible ways that we can, not just with an exhibition. So, and also the challenge that we had at the time that we wanted to challenge is that there's always a space in between exhibition and the audience. And we were trying to find a way how to bring the audience and the such event as close as possible. And so when we um, designed this, this package, to us it was very important that what would happen when the package was received. When the package was received, this, the community, so this, also this exhibition wasn't just meant to be in museums or, 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 or uh, galleries. It was to be meant to be displayed in small communities where people work, where people go to school. And so it was intended for small communities, and we really wanted the community to be part of the exhibition, not just look at the exhibition. So when they received this package, they had to open it and carefully, you know, uh, well, I can show it, but carefully uh, uh, take out all the photographs, all the posters, make them flat, and that's when we saw the connection, direct connection between the community and the people in the posters. Each poster became the person and became, and the story became integrally connected with the community because they are the one finishing the process of the exhibition. And then when the exhibition was in, you know, in the schools and, and was in, in whatever was used, there was already, the community was already part of this discussion, of this discourse, of this dialogue. dialogue. And this is what to us was really sparked engagement and will spark the interest whoever was going and, and the audience was going to this <clears throat> exhibition. Sorry, my voice is <coughs> going. So, and I think that this is really the bottom line of what we're trying to do, is engage people in the most possible and direct way. Uh, so, um, sorry? Oh yeah, I can, I can, sorry, I forgot to <laughs> go through. I just want to show some details of, you know, the material is like, you know, like the string does indent the carbon, but that's part of our process. Why do we have, you know, it's, it's part, it's used, it's part of the experience, so things need to be somehow not look new and perfect. And then we have, uh, this was part of, these are part of the posters and uh, found the spreads of the project. And there were, as I said, 20 posters, all on women in Afghanistan. And this is a school in Chicago in which we engaged the students and they themselves put together and hang the exhibition. So, and I think it's very great to see 
the action, them in action, and I'll see how they're getting involved in, from the beginning. And uh, this, you know, and it's, so also the beauty of it is that each exhibition was very site specific and it was very in relation to the, where, where it was hanged and the community was hanged in. So, and then of course, uh, this exhibition also was, went to Capitol Hill. And so here was mounted in, in wood panels and was a different kind of uh, environment. But again, it was specific to that, to that environment. So, and, and, and I think that's it. That's pretty much all my presentation. <laughs> so. Thank you so much, yeah. Roger. I think you've had some really important points too. First for me is the, the importance of visualizing creatively facts, figures, but in a very local, context-specific way that brings in culture, customs, you know, local ways of expressing um, what, what they really want and need and being able to drive that narrative I think is so important. And the other point I think about these, the using art, I, it's really, we don't speak about it much, I think, in a multilateral context, but it is so important because one of my friends has told me how a photo exhibition was one of the game changers for a really top government, uh, not you, <laughs> <laughs> top government um, at the prime minister level to make their commitment to children and vaccination um, in terms of the leadership that they would play and the money that they would put in. And it was an, uh, a photo exhibition where the prime minister was just supposed to come in, give a speech and go out, but he ended up staying for more than an hour and going through the whole exhibition and it was visibly moving. And I think again, you know, in the hustle and bustle of everyday life and meetings and talking points, these things slip through the cracks, but they do make a difference and they're very powerful. So over to Thatcher, please. Great, Tell do you mind story. if I grab the... Yes, oh sure. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I brought some slides as well. I don't know if we can pull those up. Thank you. Um, but first off, thank you uh, for having me. It's a real honor to be on this panel with all of you and the amazing work you're doing. Um, so my name's Thatcher Bean. I, I'm a filmmaker that works for a nonprofit architecture firm named Mass Design Group. And I thought I might talk to everyone about why a filmmaker works for an architecture firm. Um, so this is... Uh, one of our studios, uh, we are a firm that's been around for about a decade. Uh, we're now around 100 people. We've almost doubled in size the last two years. Um, this is in, uh, outside of Kigali, Rwanda, uh, in Burera District, our Kigali team uh, sitting in front of uh, the fifth phase of an engagement we've had over a decade with an organization called Partners in Health and the Rwandan Ministry of Health to help build healthcare infrastructure. Um, it's a doctor's housing. They were having trouble keeping doctors in this part of rural Rwanda that before we built a hospital in collaboration with them had zero doctors for 400,000 people. Um, and what we try to do through our work that this project shows is we try to engage with uh, humanitarian issues as far upstream as we can. Uh, we're a nonprofit, and we promote the use of long-term infrastructure to uh, help solve humanitarian problems. So trying to promote uh, justice, equity, and human dignity uh, to prevent you know, many of the issues uh, that, that lead to uh, catastrophe in the first place. Um, Um, uh, so yeah, I joined about five years ago. Uh, the reason was I, I worked for Mass on a short-term engagement, and then after uh, visiting uh, some of their projects, was really inspired um, by the work they were doing, and we had this idea of um, architectural representation potentially could be improved through the use of film. Um, one of our thoughts was that it's a problem for the public, partners, communities to interpret architecture just through photographs uh, because it's a representation of a still object, which we think promotes this idea of uh, design as the creation of a sculptural work that doesn't necessarily have uh, utility, which we think it should, as well as beauty. We think that uh, communities deserve both. And so we've been trying for the last five years to use film to show the entire design process, or what might be called the entire generative, generative process of design. Um, so we engage in research, um, design, and then advocacy as well. Um, not only exclusively using film, but we try to use it throughout the process.
Yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear you the first time. Um, so this is a short video just showing um, some metal workers in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, who actually helped us fabricate, fabricate a performance facade for a cholera treatment center that we designed in partnership with an organization called Le Centre Gescio that was one of the world's first HIV uh, clinics in the world in Port-au-Prince. Um, and so we document the fabrication process to show how fabrication, uh, how designers through their choice uh, of fabrication can actually leave as much economic investment as possible in a community. So this facade was designed in collaboration with Virginia Tech to maximize uh, ventilation, airflow, and patient privacy. And then it was actually adapted so that it could be fabricated by these uh, artisans on the ground. Um, we use animation as well to try to show uh, what our buildings do. We believe that every building should have a mission uh, that is connected to a, a measurable outcome. So for the cholera treatment center that we designed in the wake of the earthquake in 2010 and the subsequent cholera outbreak, uh, the building was designed to actually capture rainwater, treat the rainwater on site. The rainwater was then used for patient care uh, waste was poured into poor flush toilets and then went into this underground uh, anaerobic baffle reactor and was treated on site. Um, so the mission of this building was how can a building actually stem the tide of cholera? Uh, one of the reasons it was spreading so rampantly is that uh, sewage that was being collected from temporary cholera treatment centers in the country was actually being dumped back into the groundwater. Um, and again, this was a, an example of long-term infrastructure. This project actually cost less than the organization we were working for had to pay every uh, two years in the temporary collar treatment tents um, that they were paying for. And this is one of the only remaining uh, collar treatment centers in all of Haiti. So they now actually don't treat cases really in their own catchment area. They're directly adjacent from uh, an informal settlement of 60,000 people, and they've seen less than a dozen cases from that, uh, that area that has no formal sanitation, which is a testament to their impact. Um, but also now they, they see cases from all over the country that are actually brought here. Um, and so we just think that it's an example, again, best th shown through film, uh, of the impact of, of long-term investment rather than, uh, you know, we do believe that short-term investment is, is necessary. Uh, in you know, a catastrophic setting, but that it should be paired with something that can benefit the organization over a long period of time. Um, so we actually turned this uh, engagement with our partner uh, into a 25-minute documentary that has gone on to screen uh, all over the world at film festivals. Um, this is uh, Dr. Jean-William Pop, who, as I mentioned in 1982, opened uh, one, if, potentially the world's first uh, institution dedicated to the treatment of HIV and AIDS. Uh, he now teaches at Cornell University, but is from Haiti and still lives there. Um, so the idea was that we could tell a, a, a broader story to a larger audience. We wanted to speak to the public, but also to designers and uh, partners and governments. Um, and this screened at the Clinton Global Initiative uh, to support Dr. Pop and his work. And we believe that one of the most important things we can do is, and that's critical to a building's uh, life, is actually its narrative. That without the story of the building, the building can't be supported and buildings can't uh, just function on their own. Um, and why film? Uh, another reason is we, it's a medium that can show space through time. It's pretty simple. So um, I think we're promoting the idea that architects you know, can use this. The cost has gone down uh, exponentially over the last few years to represent their work. Um, and so uh, I'm really lucky in that I get to visit most of our projects to document them uh, and then exhibit them through film rather than just uh, photographs. Um, so this is a, another project we designed in rural Malawi. It's a maternity waiting village. Um, the mission of this building was to attract mothers to give birth near a clinic. Um, so the mission wasn't to actually reduce infantile mortality. The mission was to attract mothers to come here, which then reduces infantile mortality. So we tried to give them a positive experience where they could come stay for two or more weeks uh, with caregivers. 
um, and create an environment that was really welcoming and comfortable and safe and healthy um, and beautiful. And uh, we've actually started a study to determine whether or not this is effective compared to a prototype that the government uh, was implementing. Uh, and we, we hope it has been, but anecdotally we've heard from others that they have been going and telling their communities to come uh, give birth here as well. It's a really adorable baby. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, and finally, we, we've tried to use film at a range of scales, so not just uh, myself going and, and using it uh, in different ways, but we actually um, two years ago launched the African Design Center, which is a two-year fellowship program that has a cohort of 11 designers from all over Africa who are based out of our office in Kigali. They go through a research design uh, build advocacy curriculum. Uh, and so we actually uh, created a, a, a course that taught them the skills to use film as well um, to promote their own projects. And so they used it to engage with communities. Um, they actually are in uh, getting close to finishing a primary school in collaboration with the Rwandan Ministry of Education. And they uh, just graduated. Some of them are staying on board to actually finish the school. Um, so yeah, that's that's how we we use film more generally. Uh, and thank you, thank you for watching. Thank you so much, Thatcher. And so we'll uh, move to Sean because he's the only representative of a government here on the panel. And I think government's also really important. And from that perspective, really, what influences government decisions in terms of policy positions, resources for humanitarian aid, and how does design and storytelling uh, help make that case, please? Okay, great. Um, so I'm Sean O'Hay. Um, I work uh, in the humanitarian unit of Irish Aid. We administer our uh, humanitarian aid budget, which is about 180 million euro, about 200 million dollars each year. Um, and before I was in that position in Dublin, I was in Geneva as the liaison between Ireland and the humanitarian agencies there, the Red Cross, UNHCR, WHO, et cetera. And before that, I was in Addis Ababa, uh, where our embassy covers Ethiopia and South Sudan. So very happy to be here today. It's very different from the meetings I've been covering all week at the UN. Um, different crowds, uh, different styles of presentation, much more vis visual and actually much more compelling, if I can say that. <laughs> um, so I suppose it, it shows to me uh, how important this sort of meeting is and how much we as humanitarians have to learn from the design community in getting our message across, um, a kind of a very important message. Um, and I'm here today to hopefully give you a bit of insight about in the, the thinking of, of donors and um, what influences us and um, why decisions are made and um, the challenges we face um, in communicating what we do and why we do it and seeking I suppose your help um, for for helping us advocate better on, on what we do so as we sit here now a colleague of mine is sitting in the German mission to the UN um, a few blocks away um, with a group of other donors, um, most of the main donors in the world, the US, Canada, all EU member states, in a grouping called the Good Humanitarian Donorship Meeting, and it's their annual high-level meeting. And all those donors have signed up to a bunch of principles called um, the humanitarian principles and also principles of good humanitarian donorship. So these are basically, as I think somebody set out um, before, that you provide your aid in accordance with humanitarian principles, neutrality, impartiality, uh, independence, uh, and uh, humanity. humanity, sorry, that's the last one. So, um, and I suppose that what that means in, in practical terms is that you're providing your aid uh, to help those in need and to reduce suffering and not for any other political or economic or, or strategic reasons. So all these donors have, have signed up to these principles. Um, and um, you should also be providing aid where it's needed most. So you're not providing it in the country next door necessarily, you're providing it where it's most needed. Um, uh, so you're providing, say, um, aid in Lebanon to reduce suffering um, of Syrian refugees there, not with the aim 
of, reduce, of, of keeping the, the refugees there so they won't come to Europe. Your aim really should be to reduce suffering. A byproduct could be that they don't then move to, to Europe, but you have to be clear that this is not why you're providing your humanitarian aid. So, um, and then as part of those principles, we've also signed up to work in a, as effectively and efficiently as we can in, in dispersing the aid, not attaching red tape, um, not putting a lot of strings on it. And what that means, though, is you, the most effective way to work often is in a way that's a bit bureaucratic, it's coordinated, it's pooled funding, putting all your money together so that the UN um, can react uh, quickly and efficiently whenever um, a crisis erupts so that each donor doesn't individually have to react to every small crisis. Um, and then, I suppose, finally, it's um, categorizing kind of where, where the needs are greatest. And Ireland and the EU and many other countries have a very complicated categorization of needs um, matrices where we set out where the needs are greatest and that should govern where the aid goes. So that's the principle of it. Obviously, the reality is a bit different. And um, I wanted just to set out maybe some of the constraints um, then which, which influence uh, policymakers and, and governments in this. So I suppose one of, them, one of the main things is the overall amount of money in the pot. So um, humanitarian aid, I think, um, for, for Ireland, it's um, a relatively small amount of, of, our, of our GDP. Um, but it's something that um, is continually under pressure. Um, electorates ask, you know, why aren't you spending that money at home? Charity begins at home. We have hospitals here. We have schools here. Um, why does that money need to, need to be spent abroad? Um, the second um, problem, I suppose, or issue that, that we face is, um, you know, political politics um, influencing what, where the money goes. There are domestic um, lobby groups saying the money should go here, there, or otherwhere. Um, and also governments, of course, have their own strategic priorities. Um, and thirdly, there's the allocation of resources, how we are effective and efficient. So, um, as I mentioned, one of the most effective ways is to react early um, or to even be to anticipate a crisis before it becomes a crisis. But this is quite a hard sell often. Um, I'm thinking, uh, for example, of the, the current Ebola um, uh, outbreak in, in DRC. I think the WHO is using the words um, cautious optimism on that. It seems relatively contained. It contrasts markedly with a couple of years ago. Um, I was in uh, Geneva at the time, and we were negotiating through the night on resolutions at the WHO to set up a contingency fund so in the future the WHO could react quickly before um, an outbreak was declared a, a pandemic, a public health emergency of international concern. And sort of incredibly, their hands up to then were, were tied until a crisis, be, until a health crisis became international, they couldn't react swiftly. So there now is this contingency fund, but as donors, you face a problem in, in marketing that. Um, you're, you're, sell, take, you're saying to your electorate um, that we're giving money to this contingency fund or we're giving it to a pooled fund. Um, and they say, well, what's the, what's the outcome? What did you achieve with that? And you say, well, there was no, the outbreak didn't spread. That was mm -hmm. the outcome. Um, or there was no famine. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something that we struggle with in, in, in marketing to, to electorates and to policymakers. So um, I wanted maybe just to come to um, different... Uh, Area to, to come back on these three different areas that we, we struggle with. Um, so one is um, the, the entire, the amount of money going to humanitarian aid, um, the message, so retaining that uh, level of funding or increasing it as the need. Secondly, advocacy on the places that it's spent, your forgotten crises that you, you give money to the Central African Republic, not just Syria. Um, that is in the news and the way it's which is spent, so um, being effective and efficient on that. Um, and I think Leslie just mentioned three different constituencies that you try to, um, to, to, to give your message to. And I think I would maybe add just a fourth group um, to, you said the general public, the media, 
high-level policymakers, and I'd add the fourth group of the, the lower-level policymakers, the bureaucrats, mm -hmm. the civil servants. And I think you do need quite different information products for all those all those groups. Um, and indeed, for the uh, the electorate, um, you need this sort of personal story. Bring the general back to the personal. Um, I think this is famous quote attributed to Stalin, where uh, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic, and people just you know um, ignore numbers. And I think our the IOM um, director earlier said said that as well. You know, forget about the statistics, forget about the numbers. Um, so we have these these four groups, and they all need different types of products, and 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 we st we struggle with that and um, with getting that message across. Um, and Ireland is pretty fortunate, really, uh, amongst donors in that we have broad support across the political spectrum from opposition parties, from the parties in government for the aid program, broad support from the electorate on that. But it's not something we can take for granted, and it's something we need to continually work at to become better at explaining what we do and why we're doing it in the way that we're doing it, why it's important to, to behave in accordance with these principles that I set out before. And I mean, if it's difficult for Ireland, it's so much more difficult for other countries um, who have uh, incredible pressures, um, media uh, who really attack their aid programs, mm -hmm. um, opposition parties um, who are putting out uh, messages about, um, uh, you know, deserving and undeserving um, humanitarian cases. Um, and it's really a challenge for us uh, to keep on um, producing products that people will be interested in um, and that will keep them engaged with what we're doing. Um, and I suppose I maybe get into later what sort of communications or, or design products we found useful in the past and, and uh, what might be good to engage with the design community on in the future. Um, but I suppose it's this main message about that we need to get across and uh, that we need continued humanitarian aid, you retain that piece of the pie um, of, the, of the general budget, um, and that this aid needs to be um, provided in accordance with humanitarian principles, um, and we need those, those messages to be provided to those four groups that, that I set out before. Um, and I think we'll have time a little bit later to discuss more on that. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Sean. And I think, again, that gives a reality check uh, in terms of some of the the issues that we discuss and how we can uh, affect change, because again, policymakers are very important in the big, big scheme of decision making. Um, I think the point about prevention uh, is so important because I think it's common sense that prevention is better than cure, but somehow there is no political will for that. But that's also because, again, it's difficult for po politicians to explain it to the public. And it's almost, almost like a vicious cycle. And we think about this 134 million people right now who are in need of humanitarian aid. And just think of, you know, if people could have done something sooner, faster, maybe, you know, we wouldn't have this caseload. And I think that's the, that's really right now something that everyone's trying to grapple with. Say, you know, it, it makes sense. Uh, the, and then now there's even investment cases that show how much you save if you um, act earlier rather than later. But we just haven't been able to get that political leadership. But then, again, it comes back to being able to speak to the public. So I, again, I think it's really important to see like what are those conundrums that we need to, the impasse that we need to break through. Um, so we'll go to the second round, and I think this will be quicker also. Uh, we've talked about it in different ways, and it is a very crowded global landscape in terms of the attention and the competition for attention with policymakers, with individuals, and the public. And so how could good design um, promote humanitarian advocacy that makes a difference? What should we be doing more of? What should we be doing better? Uh, what should we be doing better? and what are the things that we shouldn't do at all in a way that really helps to move the needle forward. So let's start again with Leslie and then take it the same round, I think. Um, I'll just have two very simple responses. Um, and when we look back at 12 years of doing this work, one is to build the pull. We started our work with a project called Darfur Darfur around awareness of genocide. And it was a very emotional project. We wanted to do something very quickly, bring it out into the public. We did take it all over the world. It was a major projection. It was a book we did with Giorgio. And you sort of think that Giorgio and I spend all our time working together, which is true. Um, but 
Now, as we do projects, they are incredibly and intensely multi-partnered from the beginning. So the in middle, uh, the, the first step of an idea, the first time an idea is brought to us by someone in need, the first time it begins, we are talking to who are going to be the major governments involved, who are the major NGOs involved, what are the academic groups, who are the folks on the ground, what are the impacted voices, what do they want said. Everything is developed in this process so that by the time the project is finished, we know the speakers who want to be the voices, who's representing this, where are the 30, 40, 50, 60, a documentary film we're about to come out with called The Prosecutors on Conflict-Related Sexual Violence. We have 200 to 300 civil society groups around the world ready to use the film. So what we found is if we create the pull for a project from the very, very beginning, we can get that issue out because the people who are presenting the project are never us. It's someone, some group that's in the center of the conflict or in the center of the need. And the same applies with policymakers. So we're meeting with, and, and really, thank you so much to your point, you know, I say high-level policymakers, but actually often that's the chief of staff for humanitarian affairs for Senator Richard Durbin, or it's kind of the policy director for director of such and such at the European Parliament. You know, we've had meetings with those people long before the project is fully funded or executed or so forth, so we understand when they present it on the floor, wrapped around a motion and so on and so forth, that it is going to speak to them. The flip side of that is keeping a voice of independence. We as an organization are not looking, and as a collection of artists, are not looking to be a shill for one group or another. The work is never branded by any particular organization. And that's not just because we're cranky artists, though we are. It's also because we'd like it to be very, very useful. Um, we don't want it to be partisan ever. Human rights is not owned by the right, the left, the middle, or the far out there. We want everyone to be able to use these, these kind of tools as we create them. So we find that kind of cutting through the landscape and the noise is work around that, find somebody else to pull your product, you know, and take it out there who really needs it, um, and then know the audience. The last thing I would just say is, um, you know, you were saying about kind of voters, and, and in Ireland has the happy, um, kind of situation of bipartisan support, broadly speaking, uh, for international funding, though probably never as much as one would want. Um, I'm a citizen of a country that this is insanely hotly debated. Uh, there's no reason that that should be the case. People make the argument all the time, quite accurately, that the world is safer if we're all safe and taken care of. So we really try to know the audience. What are the pressures that, for example, Senator John McCain is under at the time that he brings children of Syria? to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. What's going on right now? Can he bring a bipartisan group together and can you figure out how to deliver a product that they can use? If you're just learning that in the event, it's never gonna work. You need to know all of that information before and then you have a chance of success. Yeah, I think it's a very difficult uh, problem to tackle because <clears throat> we've done, I've done many projects and uh, I, well, I think first of all that storytelling and design are linked together, right? They cannot exist one without the other. So if there's a story to tell, and 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 as a designer we can do it, and I've done it many times. But I see that sometimes you you spend night, you know, weeks, months working and, and trying to put together this great idea, this great concept, and then you put it out there, and there's always again this disconnect. And that's what I think it's 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 hard it's hard to to uh, to see to see how to do this better. I don't know how to do this better. I, I we tried so many different things in so many different ways, and and maybe the problem is is more uh, relating to how the education and how people really do we really won't feel about this other these problems. How do we as a society respond to what these problems are? And I think that's maybe where where the biggest problem is how you know how we try to relate and how to try to uh, open a dialogue that is. Uh, listen from both sides, and and <clears throat> and and it's also well received from you know society at large, from from the audience, because sometimes most of the of the problem we bring up in our projects are not easy to deal with, are not not things that we wanna 
as a society, you know, again, uh, like to deal with and like to listen to. So uh, the first reaction it's, it's that, that we have is defense. We don't want to hear this. We don't want to deal with this because it's very hard to listen to. It's very hard to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's the whole point. That's it's like if, if we're not ready uh, to receive the message that we're not comfortable with, then we're not ready to do anything because if you're not ready to be moved, what 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 are we here for? You know, it's it's it's, and that's really what's difficult in in the in in, in this line of work. And and uh, you know, we work with Leslie, and we're doing a project on a female uh, <coughs> genitalia mutilation. It's hard for me to deal with just to looking at the photographs. It's it's a very hard subject to to digest and to work in the office. It gives me the the goosebumps. Just think about it. So how do you present this to an audience that? is going to see the exhibition while they're going to their business meeting. It's a very hard thing to do, and I think it's, it's, there's a lot that we can do, but there's also a lot that needs to be done from the other side and, and trying to be more open to listen to other people and other, and other people's problems and not always turn everything into a spectacle or something. You know, we watch the news, we go on the internet. It's, internet is fantastic. We have, we can access everything, but it's 10 seconds, and then you are next to the next page. So this is also something that's very difficult for us to deal with. And also it's, it's less human, it's very cold. So uh, I use the word spectacle, it might be the right word, but there's a disconnect again. It's like, it's one thing to feel things and to make you cry with a project and, and then looking at them on the internet and then, okay, oh, well, you know, there's an ad for your, your favorite pair of shoes next to it. So it's, it's, very, it's very complicated and a very complex thing that it doesn't have simple answers, I don't think so. <coughs> ongoing process. Yeah, I think along those lines, yeah, a challenge is that so many of these narratives are fleeting, and um, we found that buildings can be used to give them space and longevity, that buildings are narratives in themselves, and um, I think one of the critical ways they can do that is that they ha we believe they have to be beautiful. Um, and we don't mean that in a superficial way. We think that for something to be beautiful, it, it must uh, create human dignity and that everyone deserves that. Um, but a beautiful building can also become an icon that is representative of a narrative um, that people can attach onto, uh, and it signifies value. You know, there's the reason that the Bill Bao effect has become so famous. Um, but, you know, we're exploring this beyond uh, healthcare infrastructure. We uh, just uh, one of our partners, the Equal Justice Initiative, just opened the Memorial to Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, it's a mem the first and only uh, memorial in the U.S. to the history of lynching, and it's a building specifically designed to give space to a new narrative. Um, but this is something that we think about with all of our buildings. Um, how can this building uh, address issues that uh, each building in that typology is facing, and often that's through the building's narrative. Um, so with the Cholera Treatment Center is, is a good example. Um, you know, we, in order to design something beautifully, you have to understand the context. Um, so we only partner with local organizations, and we go through a really rigorous uh, immersion process with communities to figure out what it is that is beautiful and functional from, for them, and we believe that that produces long-term results as we've seen with the cholera treatment center. And when you have long-term results, uh, you know, centered on a beautiful iconic structure that people can point to over time, uh, we believe you can start to shift that narrative. Um, and, you know, we're hoping that that's what, what happens with all of our buildings. And, and we have seen success. We, um, we built our first 130-bed hospital in Rwanda 10 years ago. And in collaboration with Partners in Health and the Ministry of Health, and this wasn't just due to the hospital, but uh, in the years after the hospital opened, that district had the greatest improvements in healthcare outcomes out of anywhere in the world. Um, and so we were able to use this holistic uh, example uh, of an intervention to go to the Ministry of Health, go to Partners in Health, go to donors, uh, to say, look, we can do things upstream. They cost more upfront, but the long-term cost is lower for the outcomes you get. Uh, and you know, people still reference that hospital because it's also because it's beautiful.
Thank you so much. So um, we'll open it to the audience for any questions you might have for the panelists. Thank you very much. I'm Catherine Klein with an NGO here at the UN. And I wanted to expand the thought that everything should be resonating personally with the issue of, and the complex issue of how do you reach people who are afraid of new immigrants into their communities. And it seems to me that the kind of stories of a little girl or the six-year-old boy resonate, but why are we not explaining to people, and I work with aging communities, that the communities in your hometown are not viable without these new folks coming in and helping in every way. It seems like we're not, or maybe I don't see it, sufficiently explaining to people why it should be in their interest, not only to touch their heart, but actually to touch their pocketbook. Sorry, I made a big mistake here, so I'd like Sean also just to give a few words before we uh, take it around. Uh, I'll try to be really quick, actually, yeah, and I just had a few examples of, of what I felt had, had worked for us. I suppose we're both a producer and a consumer, um, so I wanted maybe first of all just to, just to show, so this is, um, yeah, so this is from our uh, Irish AIDS annual report, um, 2016, um, that's from 2013. Yeah, it used to be a very dry and dusty um, document. Um, it still has a lot of detail in it and a lot of stats. But we've, um, we found that when we um, engaged a team of graphic designers and, and got sort of infographics like this, um, a lot more visual, um, easily digestible, it actually had a huge amount of take up sort of when we, when we sort of tweeted out the picture and then with a the link back to the report, the hits on, on our annual report uh, really went up. Um, so that's the general. I also just wanted to say um, this is our rapid response initiative. This is where we send um, people to work with uh, various humanitarian organizations um, um, out in the field. And um, what we found is then people reacted extremely well. The Irish people, Irish public reacted extremely well to sort of these personal stories of Irish people out in the field, much better to the story of we've given five million to Carr the story of John Durkin um, out in, in Bangladesh uh, helping Rohingya really resonated a lot more than the sort of more general um, um, explanation. Um, and then I wanted to um, just talk about products um, then which, which helped for our high level policy makers. So kind of a, um, a story uh, where we had help um, from um, from the UN in putting a story together for, for one of our ministers, which had the personal and the and the um, and the more general high level. Um, coming back just quickly to my point about the kind of the lower level um, policymakers. So the, the the personal story is really important, but also for the people who are kind of making the the submission to the to the minister or who have to look through the annual report and appraise it and. Um, report, uh, do, do our own reports. We need information products um, which tell us that kind of in real time where the, where the problems are, where we need, where the funding is needed so that we can then go to our minister and say, look, CAR is really underfunded. Um, place, so that's a, a, a product from OCHA which shows you sort of in a traffic light system um, what's a, a relatively okay funded crisis and then the, when it goes down to orange, um, a, a very badly funded one, um, which is very useful. Um, and then the humanitarian pooled funds, these are country-based funds, so donors provide funds to a, uh, money to a fund within a particular country, and then the UN says we need, the, we need that to go to education or to shelter or to, to wash, and it's a very eff effective way of working, but we found it difficult to sort of explain it in a way up the line within the ministry. And um, this uh, sort of website, um, again, from the UN really helps us with that. Um, and this is another uh, story um, which um, one of our humanitarian partners, the Central Emergency uh, Response Fund, provided to us to help us market what we do. And it's 
really, <laughs> it's really important to help us because we're, as donors, we don't have the expertise. We're really reliant on our humanitarian partners providing us good, well-designed products so we can continue to fund and we can market that and stand behind it. And then finally, I just wanted to come back uh, very quickly to the personal, um, you know, no matter how hard, um, how convinced our politicians are, or we as, as, as sort of lower level policymakers, the general public has to be convinced about the need for humanitarian aid in total. And I didn't, I don't have the whole videos because they're too long, but these are two campaigns which are really effective in the UK and Ireland. And if you, later, if you have a chance to look at them, this one was the BBC, your phone is now a refugee's phone. Uh, you have to look at it on your, on your, on your cell phone and it, it shows you as if you're a, a refugee crossing the Mediterranean and, and, and the sort of things you might see um, on the way. And then this one was from Save the Children, a second a day um, in the model of those um, sort of videos on YouTube where you have people showing their weight loss uh, program or something one second a day over, over a year. And this had you imagine a girl uh, between birthdays in London, as if London became Damascus, as if um, as if there was a refugee crisis from England, and I think that's just really important. We notice it especially in Europe, um, the generation that remembers the um, the huge um, displacement in in Europe that occurred just after um, and during World War II, and the generation in the UK who remember um, schools being evacuated um, from main urban centers and being pushed into to, to villages and that kind of the, the internal displacement there. That generation is going, there is no memory. And there's this real empathy gap. People don't identify with migrants, with refugees. They don't see themselves in that. Um, and I think that is, is our, our huge problem and uh, where we really need um, new, uh, different ways of, of getting that message across. Um, that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, John, and I apologize for that. And I think you made a really good point also about the empathy gap. And um, I recall in 2015, we were already saying that the numbers of people displaced is at its highest, uh, highest since World War II. And now, two years later, we don't say that anymore. And there's a reason why. And so again, I think people don't connect with some of these things as others do. So sorry, um, let's continue with the questions, please. And we got your question, but let's take a few and then maybe um, then the panelists can respond. Someone else? Hi, uh, my name is Kent. I work for UNICEF. And um, thanks to everybody on the panel. It's very inspiring, very impressive, and very interesting. Uh, I'm concerned about my future and all of our futures, but I'm also the father of a two-year-old girl, and I'm frankly much more concerned about her future. I wonder if any of your design, visuals, films, etc., uh, if you consider, or if you're already doing it, targeting not the adults that are screwing up the world, uh, but are targeting children, young children, who can hopefully help fix the world as they become older. Anyone else? Well, I can just say that I appreciate your point because I, ha I do have two kids. <clears throat> and of course, I'm very concerned about their future as you are. Not only from a humanitarian point of view, but as an environmental point of view. So actually, it's a very good point. I never thought about uh, doing something specific to children, but it's actually probably a very good idea. <clears throat> the sooner we start, the better off we are. And actually, we are probably very late already, so uh, it's something that maybe, you know, it's a great question, and I think that it's something that we should consider doing. Exactly. <laughs> we should talk after. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So you were gonna take some more questions. Yes, um, any more questions? Uh, okay. Hi, um, I have concern. So empathy really matters, but in the same time, it has limits. So we recently seeing a lot of like, you know, stories that are having pros and cons. Maybe the pros is reaching the donation, but the cons is either creating panics or creating um, like us and them, because I see pictures of 
refugees always dirty. And I'm like, when we face, when we really see refugees, they are maybe have Nikes, and that's probably create a problem of the society. Oh, so do you really need help? Do I really need to help you? Maybe I need help. So is that creating really awareness about their needs, or more reaching out just the profit of the companies or organizations? And another concern is um, refugees have cell phones and they have access to Wi-Fi and internet. So basically, maybe after 10 years, they're going to be able to see their pictures on the cover of one of the NGOs trying to fundraise. How are we protecting their dignity, their privacy, and how are those pictures really, you know, ethically are right? Thank you so much. Uh, anyone else before we look to our panelists for answers, responses? Okay, so let's start with Leslie, and I think there were a couple of questions. I think you can speak to both. Yeah, I'll just very quickly, others may have responses. Um, to your point, uh, if I've understood correctly, about the narrowness of kind of, you know, using small children as, uh, and this actually speaks to your point as well, as um, folks that we build empathy around, that we fundraise around, I mean, we, the sort of global um, receiving society that we, we focus on, as opposed to the, it is incumbent upon all of us to keep our societies vibrant, to welcome others, that we will be better uh, from a selfish point of view, economically, we will speak more languages, we have a richer culture, we will be viable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In many countries that are receiving countries, we have negative birth rates, and literally, eventually, those, those areas will go away if we do not import populations, to be sort of statistically. Um, I think that you're absolutely right. This, this is a challenge, and that there are some great models where people have worked against this. If you look at uh, an organization called the Council on Global Affairs in Chicago, they have been incredibly effective in a bipartisan manner in harnessing the business community in the Midwest, which is not necessarily known for being particularly liberal, and saying, we're going to do surveys, polls, engagements, and dialogues. Who is your workforce? Who do you need to be your workforce? Oh, it looks like your workforce is very multinational. It looks like you need to import a lot of labor. I mean, these are kind of very blunt conversations that they have with people. And suddenly these, these folks who are hiring are very excited about getting down to Springfield and going to Washington, D.C. and explaining how they need more folks to come in and how immigration is extraordinarily powerful. This builds empathy and kind of a memory, though none of them were necessarily alive 200 years ago, but suddenly now the narratives that are coming out are about settling America. Not so much about genocide, but about settling America and that we are all immigrants and that we have this in common and so on and so forth. The other organization that has taken a new tactic, an economic tactic on a uh, humanitarian kind of crisis is the World Bank Organization. They are doing really important work on why we must address justice for conflict-related sexual violence because they are showing what happens to countries that do not address that justice and what happens to those countries' GDPs, why you need to, to really not just provide reparations or resettlement or new jobs and so forth, but if you don't kind of break the cycle, add a justice component to this, that you will never get the economies of these impact communities um, sort of back to where they were. It sounds like it's not an ethical or humanitarian muscle being flexed. I think it actually is. But um, And then the thing I would just say to your extraordinarily important note, at least in the work that we've done and lots of the really wonderful practitioners that I know, this is about agency and voice and lens. This is in Women Between Peace and War Afghanistan was curated with Afghan women over Skype, over conversations, over selecting painstakingly one image after another and making sure that should a woman who is in the photograph see her image on a website later, 10 years, two years, that she would be comfortable with that. There's all kinds of photos that never made it into that show, which would culturally have been wonderfully appropriate in North America and absolutely impossible in Afghanistan. So they're not in the show because it's not appropriate. Poverty porn, humanitarian porn, the Western gaze, these are things that if you are not paying attention to 
all the time, you are going to fall down that slope. It doesn't mean you don't do anything. I think if it paralyzes you, that's a shame. But I think you have to be very, very clear that these are the risks. Right. Uh, Thatcher, would you like to respond to something? Um, yeah, I mean, to speak to that as well, I think we also just follow a basic process of informed consent uh, in that if we don't do a lot of work filming minors, um, if we were to, we would approach it the same as we approach uh, any other vulnerable population. Uh, the two patients you saw in the cult, uh, cholera treatment center, um, Antonine Rami and Sharia Vries, we both uh, we spent time getting to know them. I think that's another part of it, is trying to represent people in a dignified way and not as just an object, but as an individual. Um, we went through a process of uh, separating ourselves from informed consent as well, bringing in a social worker to talk to them first, knowing that participating wouldn't affect their healthcare outcomes, and then we could ap approach them. So I think there are just some kind of concrete ways you can do it. Um, but yeah, again, uh, you know, what's described as poverty porn or poverty, poverty voyeurism. I think, you know, we're really interested in avoiding that as well. Just our priority is human dignity. And we feel that, uh, you know, we want to represent people the way we would want to be represented. Uh, and I think there are some challenges there because we are interested in also showing the problems that are very real. Um, but we try to have long-term relationships with the communities we work with. Uh, and document communities where we have those relationships are ongoing and we're accountable to them and we have a track record of impact and we have their buy-in. Um, to speak to the first question, um, I think in terms of changing people's minds, uh, I sound so biased since I work for an architecture firm, but again, this is where we think buildings can, can be useful. Uh, we think that you have to make people proximate to an issue um, physically, so media is really valuable, but um, you know, with the memorial in Alabama, being confronted with it spatially has a much different effect, uh, we think, than just seeing something through a two-dimensional plane. Um, this is something that our client and partner, Brian Stevenson, talks extensively about, um, being made to feel, actually feel uncomfortable and being confronted with these issues uh, in a space can be really valuable. And so he's actually working to, you know, put up markers all over the country um, to, to help do so. And a part of the memorial is actually designed in a way where there are over 800 uh, columns hanging from a roof to symbolize uh, victims of lynching in each county where a lynching occurred in the U.S. And there's actually a second copy of those columns directly adjacent to the site. Uh, and the idea is that communities across the country where these lynchings occurred will actually have to go through a reconciliation process to where they can reclaim their column and post it in their community so they can actually create that proximity again in a, in a spatial way, not just through images. Okay. So um, I think we should, I think it's almost time for coffee break and I think this has been a really rich discussion. Uh, the questions themselves I think reflect the complexity of the issue as people try to find meaning, try to connect to the ideas and that's really the world we live in and you know we have to keep these discussions live and going on. And uh, I think just to say that the point of dignity is really important because at the end of the day, uh, it is people's lives, uh, it is people's you know, heartbreak, uh, it is things that happen to people at a very personal level. And I, I do think that uh, there are different ways of doing it and there's this come kind of a standard, at least in, in some of the big uh, agencies, but it's a constant reminder. And I think it's also what a lot of the panelists said, and that's about the long term, you know, long term relationship building, long term partnerships um, to be really able to move that uh, change and, and go forward. Um, then I think um, the other point here is again um, that a lot of this is about using, uh, it's about the art and science of things, whether it's, it's visualization, uh, it's about film and creativity or architecture. It's also a lot about using the left side and the right side of the brain, but most importantly the heart. And good communications, good advocacy really hits all of it. The head, the heart, the hand in a way that really helps to bring change and transformation. So last words, Sean? 
Oh, uh, last word. As the reality <laughs> check, because, you know, we can get in different places. So. So the last word <laughs> is that I, I, I think as, as donors as, who try yeah. to be principled is that we need your help. We need the help of the design community um, and we need, um, we need to work together to find ways to, to reach those different constituencies and to tailor our message to those different constituencies. So this has been really helpful for me. Uh, thank you so much and really interesting to hear my fellow panelists speak. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you to everyone. And thank you to Ireland for doing this. <laughs>